thank you so much for joining us today, Jeremy. It's great to meet you. Excellent. Thanks for having me here. Okay, so uh, your title is uh, Director of Research at Wisdom Tree. So congratulations on being with one of the heavyweights in the ETF industry. Um, I'd be interested, uh, let's call this point B, Jeremy. Tell us a little bit about point A and how you got involved in the industry and uh, a little bit about your road less traveled on your way to Wisdom Tree. No, I got a very lucky timing. I heard you mention Professor Siegel. You know, I've been working with uh, the good doctor since 2001. Uh, I got very lucky timing. I was at Wharton uh, in 1999 after he was working on his book. Uh, you know, he had been pu published Docs for the Long Run in 1994. He did a second edition in 1998. And he started, you know, he basically gave Vanguard a lot of free publicity. He said, buy the market, buy it cheaply, uh, until really the tech bubble, where he started writing op-eds in the Wall Street Journal um, right. Starting in April of 99, our internet stocks overvalued, are they ever? Followed up by big cap tech stocks, our suckers back in March of 2000. I met him right after that article came out and okay. really started working for him a year later and uh, been really working with him ever since. And you know, a lot of the research that went into the book I helped him write, The Future for Investors, came out in 2005 was How Do I Protect Investors from Bubbles? And Wisdom Tree was doing a lot of research on similar concepts, sort of reweighting indexes away from market cap towards fundamentals, and we met them in 2004 as the book was getting final stages, and it was just sort of a perfect marriage. Uh, Professor Siegel invested in Wisdom Tree at the start. Uh, he liked the approach because it was very consistent with our research for the book, and uh, you know he joined as a strategy advisor. They brought on me to lead research, and I've been there officially since 2004, 2005. Yeah, I mean, some people call it luck, Jeremy. I call it that you were blessed greatly. To, you know, you know some of the winding, broken roads that people take in this industry. For you to, um, you know, ended up working with uh, someone that was your professor that uh, has called major turns in the market. To have a mentor like that uh, was is really, you know, almost providential. So you were, you did something right. I don't care if you believe in karma or what, but uh, yeah, what you. a great, what a great break for you to, you know not have to go through a lot of the heartache that people do in this industry. I'm sure you've had your rough times, uh, everyone does, but congratulations on, on that journey. So now that we know that, uh, you know, you have a silver spoon in your mouth when it comes to the business, <laughs> why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what you're thinking? Uh, yesterday we had a brief conversation. You said you wanted to talk about some currency ETFs. I have some other questions for you, but uh, perhaps you could give us uh, your view and what type of ETFs that you're focused on going forward since we're near the end of the year. What looks good and what looks compelling going into 2018? Very good. Well, I appreciate that. You know, Wisdom Tree, when we started out in 2006, we launched a lot of dividend weighted equity strategies around the world, and those were trying to protect investors for valuation risk and really solve for valuation timing. Uh, we really have become known for currency hedging equities. Um, our two largest ETFs at the firm, we have about nine and a half billion in a Japan currency hedged ETF, that's DXJ, and we have about eight billion in a European currency hedged ETF, which is HEDJ. You know, we were the first firm to think in the US really what is the role of currency in portfolios why do people do what i call a double decker strategy which is most people well, you're, hedging, you're hedging the currency yes yeah. so a, a lot of people a lot of people would make money on the asset appreciation but then give it back on the currency depreciation is that correct that was exactly the case for japan you know we were the first room to take out the yen so you could just buy the nikkei stock or right. the japanese list of stocks and in 2012 to 2014, as the yen started depreciating, we were the first firm to focus on that. And, uh, you know, when the yen was going down and the stocks were going up, you didn't want to have that yen. Now, broadly, I still think that concept is just in its infancy for the broader national markets. I'd say like 20% of Europe and Japan ETFs or assets in general in the U.S. are now hedged. But I think there's about $2 trillion invested in international stocks that package the stocks and currency together. And I, I don't think that's really the, 
the, the appropriate long run strategy. I think people should be thinking more actively about it. They should have a view. Do they want the euro? Do they want the yen? And if they don't have a view, they should more often start hedged um, or they should have a systematic model to try to adjust that, which is really our latest thinking, trying to create a, a rules based alpha signal on top of the equities to try to dynamically determine how much currency you want. Does uh, Wisdom Tree have a dollar view now or going into uh, 2018? I think the big question for currency traders is from the beginning of last year, the dollar index sold off probably comparable to the UUP. Um, it sold off from 104 to the 92 level. We've recovered in the last few months. Uh, the question on a lot of currency traders' mind is was that a correction in a bull market with one more blow off to come or was that a cyclical or even secular high and that you should be selling strength in the dollar on uh, every rally? So I was alluding yeah. to the fact that we now sort of have this dynamic factor model to try to determine how much hedging we should do. Um, you know, I, I, in yeah. some ways, if I'm looking at sentiment and flows, I think we came into the year really expecting a strong dollar or the dollar moved after the election. Um, yeah, Trump, Trump, Trump got what he wanted, didn't he? He, he it, people were sort of peak Trump pessimism, I think, in a lot of ways. And every flow, every dollar that went into international ETFs this year, over a hundred billion dollars went unhedged. So you can just see the sentiment is going back to layering this currency on top of equities. And I think, yeah. you know, if I'm just doing a sentiment trade, I would lean against that. I would be more in favor of the dollar. Um, but if I'd say, how do I systematically determine it in some of our rules-based hedging programs, we have this three-factor model, momentum, carry, and value. Um, this was the data as of 930. We show it on our website every day, so you can look currency by currency to see what it is. It's really only momentum that will change more. Uh, you can see as of 930, it was all pointing towards a weak dollar, stronger foreign currency, not a single currency was hedged on the momentum signal, while you have mm -hmm. rates suggest a stronger dollar only against Australia, New Zealand, are you paying something to hedge versus you're being paid 1% plus and the rest. Uh, and then value on our model only is the euro not hedged fully. Um, we have a half hedge for things like the yen and the pound. We have a full hedge for Swiss and Norway. Um, so it roughly, well, if you look uh, at our would, Unhedged would mean you're more constructive that underlying currency. Yeah, less of a hedge. Okay, got it. So, so roughly, you can see we're only a third hedge the euro, half hedge the pound, half hedge the yen. You know, so for the major international benchmarks, it's roughly 40 to 50 percent hedge today. Okay. All right. So uh, that that's the way. Do you trade any of the individual? Uh, does Woodson Tree sponsor any of the individual currency ETFs? You know, we do actually have a straight currency fund, USDU. Um, for a strong dollar. So that that was tied to the Bloomberg dollar index, um, which is, you know, okay. versus the DXY, which is much more Euro focused. It's a much more diversified, has some of the emerging market currencies like Mexico and Korea, I believe in there. Uh -huh. Okay. So that's a long currency on the dollar. We also have CEW, which is our emerging market currency fund, which is a basket of equally weighted emerging market currency. So that's sort of like our weak dollar play for going long currency ETF. Uh, and we do do some things like Brazil and, and, and China as well for sort of the one-off currencies. Okay. Uh, do you want to talk about uh, rates at all? And uh, I know that you probably have many ETFs uh, on different durations in the bond market. Uh, uh, are you starting to see, because of all the money that actually during this bull market and stocks flowed out into bond funds, that people are beginning to use ETFs to possibly hedge their bond portfolio or take spec positions for an interest rate rise? You know, we do have a very interesting set of fixed income ETFs. Um, let me just go to my website and pull up one of, let me just pull up where you can find more information on that. Um, so we do have this category, income ETF, interest rate strategies. And you'll okay. see we have five ETFs listed under industry strategies, aggregate zero duration, aggregate negative duration, high yield zero duration, and high yield negative duration. Where we've seen, and then we have this U.S. floating rate treasury fund, which is sort of treasuries with the floating rates that we set, uh, sort of the shortest duration 
treasury fund you can get through the re rates reset every two weeks. Um, you know, we've seen the most interest in high yield zero duration, HYZD, because uh, you're picking up some good rates um, in terms of yields, and then, but then you have zero duration risk. I'm sort of just pulling up the website here. You know, the average uh, embedded income yield is 5%. You see basically a zero duration. Um, and so there you're collecting the spread essentially on the high yield credit spread versus taking any interest rate risk. Um, and we do really do the opposite too. I mean, you could go negative duration. If you wanted to say, how do I get paid to bet on rising rates, HYND has a negative seven duration um, and you're being, you know, you're being paid this embedded income yield of 4%. So you're not like costing to short. Now, of course, there's that credit spread and if equities, you know, blow down and the credit spread get blown up, that's not, this is the exact opposite of where you want to be. This is the, if you have a recession, this is going to be down the most. Um, but this is sort of one interesting way in terms of hedging duration is you get the negative seven duration with the credit spread. Um, we're, okay. But the high yield zero duration is, is definitely slowly and surely gaining traction for us. Um, I'd say the other strategy that we're seeing a lot of interest in where you know, a lot of people have gone to active fixed income managers, we have this yield enhanced ag, AGGY, which is essentially core fixed income but reweighting towards a little bit of, it's all within the investment grade, sort of priced very aggressively at 12 basis points that constrains duration, tilts to credit, tilts away from treasuries, you know, embedded income yield of 3%. And so we're seeing, we're definitely seeing some, that's probably sort of a slow and steady, it's about 250 million of assets. Uh, we're seeing a nice, nice growth in that ETF of just sort of what we would call smart beta for fixed income, where you're reweighting the ag instead of just being market cap weighted more towards yield with uh, constraining duration. Okay, well, you gave me a nice segue when you talked about the negative duration ETF that would uh, not work for you if there was a risk-off move in equities and we had a big flight to quality into bonds. And recently, I saw Professor Siegel on CNBC, and he was completely right, uh, even underestimated it to some degree, the strength of equities. But I do recall him saying during that interview that 2018 was not going to be like 2017. It was going to be a more difficult year for the market. It wasn't like he was getting bearish, but it's the first time I've heard him not be completely sanguine about the market. Uh, do you know what he's seeing and what he thinks and do you concur with it? Yeah, he's mostly thinking, you know, we're running out of catalyst uh, in terms of what's going to push the market higher. We had, you know, very strong earnings growth this year and, you know, we've been, everybody's been looking forward to this tax change that might get corporate taxes lower and boost profits. So maybe we get eight to 10 percent profit boost in large caps and maybe 15 percent profit boost in small caps. But that is increasingly getting priced in. Now, I wonder, you know, just anecdotally looking at some individual small cap stocks that I track, like if it's actually been priced in or not. Um, I'm not sure it has been priced in to all of them. I haven't seen okay. some big jumps as the taxes have been, have been happening. So there might be more, you know, of actually the tax changes actually getting priced into earnings estimates. So we'll have to see how much really does, you know, how much do analysts move up estimates once the corporate tax rate is finalized. But okay. that's what he's really thinking is that the ca that we're getting priced in on tax reform. We've had right. very strong growth, and you just you need need to see continued earnings growth. Plus, you have one, the Fed. Yeah, one, things. when things couldn't look any better, they usually don't get much better. So uh, that's kind of what he's thinking. Uh, I have a question from one of my teammates, okay. and you know the big trend, uh, which has been towards you know your segment and niche has been. Um, passive investing by people buying ETFs, uh, specifically spiders. Um, Steve would like to know if and when we ever got a market correction, if that can actually exacerbate a decline. Well, I think that my big picture view on what's happening with ETFs and passive is that fees are coming out of the industry. So in, in, in past, people use the active managers and they paid them higher fees. Right. And now people are just saying, you know, in aggregate, my exposure was the market. I, I package all these sort of more expensive active strategies together in a portfolio and I've had some value managers and growth managers. 
you know what? When I package it together, it basically looks like the spider or the you know low cost beta. So I'm going to just reduce fees. I have a lower expected return, so fees are more important. And so generally, I think that trend is what's happening. Um, now, if, if markets were to sell off and flows were to come out, the question is, are people more likely to, is there going to be a huge liquidity gap because more people are likely to sell the ETF than when they had the active managers? And that's a very hard thing to quantify ahead of time if people are going to trade the ETF more than they would have traded their mutual funds. Um, okay. But I, I think generally it's been a well, it's positive. faster anyway. It's faster anyway. I mean, usually when you sell a mutual fund, they have a couple of days to liquidate and uh, pay you your NAV, don't they? But in ETF, uh, all you have to do is push a button. Well, it, it depends if they have cash. If it depends if the portfolio manager has cash on hand. Um, if they okay. if they if they have like a five percent cash buffer, well, a they're not going to participate up in the market. So. They, you know, you could say they have a cash drag generally over time if they're using that 5% cash buffer to help pay for redemptions. Um, and that's okay. just another reason why people like ETFs is if they want asset allocation, they want to be fully invested and they get, get what they want. Um, a lot of people worry about that with fixed income ETFs generally that we were just talking about, that, oh, these active managers, when there's liquidation, they'll be able to choose which bonds they want to sell. And I think a lot of that also is sort of smoke and mirrors, that – you know, there's not really that much difference between the fixed income ETFs and the active managers. We have flexibility in terms of our portfolios that we want to redeem if there's redemption. And just because you don't see it, like you don't see what the active manager is doing. It's more opaque. So you think they're doing something much different. With the ETF, everything's transparent. Um, so you can see what prices you're, you're collecting. You know, if you're having to sell the ETF when there's no liquidity in the market, you see what the bids are. You don't see it with the active manager. But there's transaction costs there, too. So... No, I think that's the, the main benefit of ETFs is just it's full transparency on what you can transact at. And, uh, you know, it's not really that different between the active and passive there. Okay. Well, I'd, I'd like to wrap it with uh, uh, being selfish, and I have a question for me. So, Jeremy, I'm thinking we trade 2,700 S&Ps, uh, plus or minus, you know, 1% in the coming days or weeks. And then I'm expecting uh, – a sell-off to 2,100 in the S&Ps, about 20% or better to 2,100. What would be the best highly leveraged bearish ETFs from Wisdom Tree to consider? You know, Wisdom Tree doesn't or a scenario really, like that. We, we don't do a lot of short funds, to be honest. We have a, a put writing fund, but that's sort of just collecting premium and okay. Um, you know, sort of capping your upside, but it, right. it and maybe better on that market, but we're not going to go up during the decline. So okay. it's, whether it's pro shares or direction, there's other people who do leverage inverse ETFs that will either okay. be one time time. That's not really our ballywick. Um, okay. We did launch uh, for, for you know, a start one. Start one. Well, yeah, we're, we're thinking about it. <laughs> the, there's two funds here, dynamic long short, DYLS, and DYB, dynamic bearish. Now here, we actually do employ a quant model to determine when we're gonna go short. So DYB can go short the market. Uh, and actually last January and February, it was fully short the market. But the idea is it will have a net zero to negative beta. So like when, we have, when our signals don't suggest being short, it's net 25 beta. It has a basket of stock with a 75% hedge in the most optimistic time. Uh, okay. But then it can go short. Um, so, but it's not short yet. So DYB is one, if you wanted to say, as a strategic bearish fund um, that will help, you know, that will have its own model for, for hedging. That's oh, that's one a pearl. So uh, without even owning this ETF, um, would just someone who went to your website know when that fund did get yep. short the market? Absolutely. Every month you make it public, you go to the website right here. Um, there, the... Is it on the on the holdings? Um, Will you let me know on Twitter, Jeremy, when that happens? We can, we'll, we'll try to make sure we're connected. Um, but <laughs> it, on the index page, if you go to the index page, Dynamic Bearish Equity Index, you'll see the hedge ratio here is 75 percent, right. um, and you can see the portfolio here component. It's long this basket with the 75 percent right. hedge, and what you would see right. is long a treasury basket with a negative one, and so that's okay. when you would know it's fully short the market. Okay. What a great interview, Jeremy. I'm so glad I reached out to you and 
Um, my hope is you have a Merry Christmas and a, a great 2018 and not just financially in every way and that uh, great work and uh, I think that people should look into this. I don't think there's uh, any strategy that Wisdom Tree doesn't cover for people to be able to participate in uh, regular and even very esoteric ways with uh, a great crew and the way you've designed these ETFs. So congratulations on uh, really providing a service for investors and traders to be able to take advantage and exploit many different things in the market. Very good, and I appreciate that. And you can stay connected with us on our blog. We do daily content on all these different topics, currencies, fixed income, emerging markets, Europe, Japan. Uh, so I appreciate your support. Thanks for having us. We'd love to come back. Okay, Jeremy. Good hunting, my trading warrior brother. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you again. And uh, thank, you. thank you, Space. Thank you, team. Remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. See everyone next week. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks again, Jeremy. Adios.